Someone right before the service gave me a really good example of Pastor Dave's maxim on how to meditate the Word. What's the first law of meditation? You don't ever, for any reason, and that means not ever. I won't, I won't take it to the extreme this time. But you don't ever lift a verse out of its setting. And he says, because otherwise you could teach this doctrine. And it's a, now this is a joke, okay, okay. This is a joke. Otherwise you might teach this doctrine. He said, did you know that you can be scriptural in telling everyone that God has a brother? Yeah, I know I looked at him the same way you're looking at me. God has a brother? Well, yeah, you got chapter and verse for it. You can look it up if you want or look it up later, but it's 1 John chapter 4, verse 21. This commandment have we from him, that he who loves God love his brother also. <laughs> now, does that, if that's not a classic example of lifting a verse out of its setting... <laughs> If you love God, you've got to love his brother. Oh, my goodness. That, I mean, that made my day. I don't know if it does any good for you, but I'll tell you, it's good to laugh. It's good to laugh. My mother, who's going to be 96 next month, she said there's two secrets to longevity. One, keep on breathing. <laughs> she said it's vitally important. Number two is her favorite verse, is a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Amen. Amen. So it's good to laugh. Now just so there's no confusion, God does not have a brother. <laughs> it's a joke, okay? It's a joke. I think we should leave that on. People need to, leave, need to laugh. Hallelujah. Okay, open up to Matthew 10. Put a marker in Luke 10. Um, here we go again. Remember when Dave would hold up that yellow pad? Here lately, okay, let's, let's do it for old time's sake. Oh, no, the dreaded yellow pad. Of course, mine is white. But Dave, he would handwrite his, uh, his letters. And, and uh, of course, then later on, he'd try and read from that yellow pad to us. And he said, this guy writes in tongues. <laughs> he would have trouble reading his own handwriting. And mine is worse than Dave's, I think. That's the reason that I, I have to type mine. But again, and here lately I've been writing these letters. Really, they're teachings to me. It helps me process the Word. And, and I, I pray, you just don't know. Some of these, I, I, the date that's on them is usually the date that I'm ready to file it. Like, okay, I think this teaching is complete. But sometimes these go on for years. Because I'll get a little more and I'll get a little more. And I know it's not complete yet. But now, here lately, when I've been... Uh, uh, writing these, I've really, I've been having a, my friend Gene, G-E-N-E -E in mine, he's a guy, I'm not writing to no girl now, don't you be telling Sue, I'm writing to no girl named Gene, this is a guy. So, let's look at Matthew 10 verse 1 just for a moment, get your mind going down this path. And yes sir, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preface this teaching with this, I'm telling you, I, I'm going I'm to be 70 next month myself, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. What's 69? 70, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the club now with Tim and Dave. I'm in the 70s, you know. And, uh, but I'll tell you, in all my life, I've been born again since 1980. And, in all, and I've, we've been through things, you know, you all have heard some of our struggles and you've been through stuff. But I'm telling you, I, we're in a season right now where, I mean, if I'm going to be moved by what I see, I have never seen the like of it on, on just about every, every front, everything, you know, you can think of, family and financial and the church and, just, you know, you just pick it. And, it, and see, that's the only gospel that the devil has. He doesn't have the word. His whole, everything that he does, persecution, affliction, the cares of this world, everything that he does is for the word's sake. All of that is designed to eliminate your faith in the word of God. So I've done made up my mind. The more he's going to preach at us with circumstances, the harder I'm going to try and preach the pure word of God. Whether I'm seeing the results of it, whether I'm not seeing the results of it, what has that got to do with the truth, which is God's word? It doesn't change the word. And I believe if we keep preaching the word, we're going to walk in more of the word. 
And the more we walk in the word, his word will change the circumstances. Amen. Amen. So, Matthew 10, verse 1, and this, and really if we backed up a little, and I'm going to condense because of time, I did this message a little bit Sunday night, but that was just the beginning. We're going to go a little farther. If you back up into Matthew chapter 9, you'll, well, let's just, let's, we better do it. See, I always have my plan, <laughs> but I had told him I would do, always do my best to obey him in every service. So when I feel like right there, I was going to go ahead with my plan, and I felt his resistance, like, no. <laughs> All right, so better to yield, better to obey. Okay, so let's back up into chapter 9 so you can see what's going on. Verse 35. Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Now, you've got to understand one thing. Now, this is preview of a message to come, not today's. Jesus was not teaching the new birth. He was teaching as though they were already rebirthed. That's why a lot of people want to throw out a lot of his teachings, like uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And the reason they want to throw it out or put it under the Old Testament or do away with it somehow is because the Sermon on the Mount cannot be lived in your natural strength. It is impossible for a mere human. It is impossible for a son of Adam. But it is not impossible for the sons of God. Jesus fulfilled every bit of it, and we have the potential to fulfill every bit of it. We are to walk as he walked. As he is, so are we when we get to heaven. In this world. See. So he's teaching. He's not teaching the new birth, but he's teaching as though they're already born again. So what is he really teaching? What's he teaching these people? Well, uh, again, this is not today's message, but shortly after this, he begins teaching in, in Matthew's account, the sower sows the word. And he plainly tells his disciples, well, I teach them in parables. I'm teaching you the mysteries. Unto you has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. But I teach them in, in parables. And he also says a really important thing that Mark leaves out of his message on sowing the word. In Matthew's account, he says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, they just flat don't understand it. Then the enemy comes and he takes away that which was sown in their heart. Well, that's really interesting, though, because look, and that's true, but look here in verse 35 again. What's Jesus doing? Now, these are, these are the people, the masses of people. Jesus, his, his modus operandi, his, his standard method. Notice he would, went out all the cities and villages, number one, doing what? Teach. Teach first. He would teach. Why? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now, his, con his condensed version of his message was, repent and believe the gospel. Now, what was the gospel? Everywhere he went, the kingdom of God is at hand. If something is at hand, it's within your grasp. It means you can have it now. What's the end result of the people? See, he would teach first, teach, because now I'm just, this is Gary's assumption. I would, what they had was the Old Testament. He would probably teach. Now I'm thinking because the end result of his teaching here and this, on this one, he healed every sickness and every disease. It seems reasonable to me that somewhere in his message he would teach about I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the God that healeth thee. They had that. They had that scripture. So he's saying this scripture is fulfilled today. So that he would teach, then he would preach. Well, what's preaching? Preaching is exhorting you to believe what was taught. He was encouraging them. Now, you've got to believe this. It's one thing to know it. God revealed himself by these redemptive names. I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now, you've got to believe it. He would preach, but see, then he would demonstrate. And they would come, and they would lay their, he would lay his hands on. Now, he plainly says, they don't understand all the mysteries of the kingdom. 
He says, they don't understand to his disciples. It's given to you to understand. They don't understand, but they understood enough to be healed, and so do you. I didn't get nearly enough. <laughs> now, here, before the end of this, this lesson today, not only did they understand enough to be healed, they understood enough to be used in healing. See, I'm real quiet again. They understood enough to be used in healing. Well, Alan, if we pay them, will they amen? <laughs> well, do we need a sign, amen, here? <laughs> like, like applause on TV, amen, you know. <laughs> so let's go now. So with, okay, so he's teaching and he's preaching and healing every sickness. Don't you love that? Every sickness, every disease. Have you meditated? Have you, have you gone to those? I've been there. I mean, with all that's in me, like a movie, I've been there. I've, I've watched him. Another one, another place it says he laid his hands on all of them. He laid his hands on them. How long do you reckon those meetings were? He lay, he's like a shepherd with a sheep, one by one. You know, the shepherd, he would, he would inspect the sheep when he brought them into the corral in the evening. He'd look them over, see if any of them got cut or bruised or if any of them were bleeding, maybe caught in the briars or something. That shepherd, he'd, he'd talk to them lovingly. One of my favorite things in all, the, now this is uh, something I learned not in the Bible, but a, a shepherd, they were interviewing a shepherd, a modern day one, in Israel. And they still have shepherds there to this day. And he says, you know, in the evening, we don't have separate corrals for all the different shepherds. He said, we have one big safety place where we let all the sheep come, and they all go in there, and then we post a couple of sentries, you know, and the rest of us, we can get some sleep. And the sheep can rest and be safe. So the, the guy interviewing him says, well, how do you know in the morning which sheep are yours? He said, well, that's a real easy. Each shepherd, one by one, will go to the gate, and he'll call his sheep. And his sheep know his voice. Does that bless you or what? His sheep know his voice, and each shepherd will go with his sheep one at a time. You know his voice. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Jesus loves us. He's like the shepherd, each one individual. Each, each one. I'm going to pour in the oil and the wine. Have you been hurt? Let me look you over. Let me fix you up. Did you have a good night's sleep? I love you. Can you hear the shepherd's voice? I'm going to have a good day. I found a new pasture for you today. It's going to be a good day. Hmm. We, could just, we could just camp right there and have Christmas. We could have Christmas right there, couldn't we? Is that not good? No wonder here, when the angels, when the baby was born. No wonder. Where'd the angels go? Didn't, he didn't announce it in the king's court. Those angels didn't announce it in the king's court. They went to the hillsides where the shepherds were because the shepherd had been born. Man, that's a good Christmas story, but that's not today. <laughs> but look at verse 36. See, really, how long did that service last? But when he saw the multitudes, there were so many people. He was moved with compassion on them because they, they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. There wasn't enough. It was just him. And the more he did it, the bigger the crowds got. And the more he did it, the bigger the crowds got. And finally, it's just, there's just too many. So then saith he unto his disciples, boy, and this is what he's saying today, worldwide, and to us individually. The harvest truly is plenteous. But the laborers are few. Pray you therefore the Lord of the harvest. That he will send forth laborers. Into his harvest. You reckon they did? I bet they prayed that. He, that's what he said. He said go pray it. I bet they did. And then look what happens in chapter 10. When he had called. Unto him his twelve disciples. He gave them power, and that is the word exousia, that is authority. He gave them authority against unclean spirits 
to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases. Now, back up to verse 35. He was teaching, preaching, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And now he gave them authority to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. He is multiplying the laborers in the harvest. Because even when he was physically on the earth, there's too many. So he began multiplying. Now just come down to verse 7. We've only got an hour to this morning. <laughs> As you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. See, okay, what is the results of their preaching? Because the purpose of the preaching is just like before. Teach, preach, then heal. Why? Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Okay? So as you go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, what did that mean to the people? It means sick person, you can be healed. Otherwise, why heal the sick? Cleanse the lepers. What? Raise the dead. Cast out devils. Freely you have received. Freely give. And boy, they did it too. Now in Luke's account, uh, chapter 10, you don't have to turn to all these, there might be too many because I got to... Luke 10 is when he sends out the 70. Because apparently 12 was not enough. He sent out 12. Well, same thing. They started having the same results and the crowds got bigger. Started having the same results and the crowds got bigger. We need more laborers. I'm going to appoint 70 more. And what I love about these 70, well, there's a lot of things. But one of the main things that dawned on my lightning quick mind one day, as far as I know, we don't know the name of a single one of those 70. And I think that's by design. I think that's on purpose by God. So that we would understand they were Joe Public and Mary Wallpaper. They were people and there are no names. He's trying to encourage us in our generation. If I call them, I can call you. Amen? <clears throat> so in Luke's account, Luke 10, verses 8 and 9, here's his commission to the 70. He says, Whatever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. Verse 9 says, And heal the sick that are therein. And say unto them, same message, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Now, they may not have understood all the mysteries because we could, if we put this all in context, Jesus plainly told his 12 disciples, he said, no, to them it's not given to know all these mysteries, but to you it's given. But I'll tell you this much, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They knew enough to be healed. The message was simple enough, and that's what we've got to get it down to. We've got to get it simple enough so that Mr. and Mrs. Tulsanite your average Tulsanite, your average Immokaliite, your average Daytonite, <laughs> our friends Jim and Bronk and around the world, the message has to be clear enough. He will heal you, and he will heal you today. Right. He is the Lord that healeth thee. They understood that much. Yeah. They understood enough to come and have him lay his hands on them, and then they understood enough to bring their sick Aunt Susie <laughs> or their sick daughter, or whoever it was. We have got to come to that place. Now, the message today, <clears throat> the results of both ministries, the 12 and the 70, they were both successful. Now, for example, you don't have to turn there, but okay, so he sent out to 12, and in Luke 9, 6, it says they departed. They went through the towns, preaching the gospel. Now, what's the, what were they preaching? The kingdom of God is available. The kingdom of God is at hand, okay? Preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Hmm. The 70, you could look this up in Luke 10, 17 later. 
The 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Now with that background, let me, let me read my letter a little bit here. Gene, in both cases, for the 12 and the 70, the commissioning was done by Jesus by the spoken word. There is no indication that he laid his hands upon them or anointed them with oil. Now he may have, but if he did, it was left out. Meaning, what we need to know is left in. So how did he tell? Okay, let me keep reading. Jesus, as the king of the kingdom, commissioned them by the spoken word alone. The word of the king was sufficient for the Holy Spirit to co-labor with them to manifest the signs and wonders that would accompany their preaching of the kingdom of God. Gene, I've meditated on this a lot. I've tried to put myself in the position of the 12, or I've tried to put myself as one of the 70, just somebody that he called. And I've tried to picture what that was like. Maybe as I was walking away with another one, because <clears throat> he sent them two by two. So as, as we walked away two by two, from the commissioning by Jesus. And we just read what he said. Preach the gospel. Heal the sick. Cleanse the leper. Raise the dead. I wonder, as they walked away, did they feel any different after he spoke? We have no record that there was any supernatural activity that accompanied their commissioning. There's no record of Gabriel's trumpet sounding. No ram's horn, no liquid sunshine from heaven, no brush of an angel's wing across their cheek. Today we would say no goosebumps. What did they have as evidence that when they spoke in his name, the signs and the wonders would happen for them the same way that they happened for him? What did they have? They had the word of the king. And that was enough. And I was meditating on this. And a verse. To me kind of an obscure verse floated up. And it's from Ecclesiastes 8.4. You can look it up later if you want. It's really just the first half of the verse. But it says. Where the word of the king is. There is power. When you look up the Hebrew word translated power there. The root of that Hebrew word simply means dominion. And doesn't that make sense? What defines a king? Dominion. And if you have the word of the king, you walk in the dominion of the king. Amen. Amen. I've tried to meditate, Jean, what the mindset of the disciples must have been like when Jesus commissioned them to go forth two by two into the cities to do the same works he was doing. They had no doubt watched in awestruck wonder as Jesus opened the eyes of the blind, healed the sick, and cast out devils. One thing was for sure in their minds. Jesus could certainly do those miracles and perform those healings. They had no doubt about that. But now he was sending them forth to do the very same works. And he was not physically going with them. They had never in their lives been used to do a miracle or to perform a healing. Up until now, it was always Jesus who did the works. I've tried to imagine the discussion as they journeyed toward the first city where they were to teach, preach, and heal the sick, cast out devils. I tried to picture the two of them as they walked along the dusty trail. Perhaps one turned to the other and said, do you feel any different? 
Did you feel any kind of power or special anointing when Jesus told us what to do? And I can imagine the other one responding, no, no. In fact, there wasn't any emotion at all. I didn't feel anything special. I only heard the words that he spoke. But then there was a silent agreement in their eyes. Because one thing they knew for sure. Jesus cannot lie. Their faith was not based on any emotion or feeling. Was not based on any past experience for themselves. Their faith to go and do what he said. Was based on the word of Christ alone. Or you could say based on the word of the king. Now, they knew it was the Holy Spirit who actually manifested the miracles when Jesus would minister because he kept telling them that. And they were fully aware that Jesus performed no miracle nor healed any person until after he himself had been baptized by the Holy Spirit. They knew it was the Holy Spirit co-laboring with Jesus to perform the works of the Father. They knew that. Jesus himself was not going with them. They had to wonder, was the Holy Spirit going to go with them too? <laughs> Would the Holy Spirit perform the same works when they ministered in the name of Jesus as he did when Christ ministered himself? I can see them at the first village. The time came when they were to find a public place to begin preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. They had seen Jesus teach and preach the same messages many times. So they taught, and then they preached. But then it came time to demonstrate what they had been speaking. When they gave the invitation to come forward for healing, and the first sick, diseased people stepped forward, it was a time for not words only but demonstration of the Spirit and of power. They prayed for that first sick, sick person, and the person was healed. They commanded a devil to come out, and it came out. They quickly learned that the Holy Spirit was co-laboring with them to manifest the Word of the King. Or you could say the Word of God. It's the same thing. I like to put it this way for my meditation's sake. Jesus hand-trained those first disciples. First they watched him do the works, but then he trained them to do the works. But after the resurrection and just before his ascension into heaven, he gave them the assignment of training many other disciples to do the same works. Now, go ahead and turn to these two places, Matthew 28 and Mark 16. I know we've been there a lot of times. We may be there a lot of more times. A lot of more times. A lot more times. Matthew 28. And again, if I was going to go by circumstances, I wouldn't preach this message. Recent circumstances that we've had even here in the church are designed to make, make us all run like scalded dogs and begin compromising the Word of God and coming up with doctrines that are not in there. But if that same person that just graduated to heaven was here and heard me compromising, I don't think that would make her happy. I know it wouldn't make him happy. So our job is to preach the truth Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We will walk as he walked. We'll, have the, we'll talk as he talked and we'll have the same results that he had because he said we would. And he can't lie. So Matthew 28. Now again, I want to get your mind. Jesus hand trained the twelve. First they watched him do it. Then he gave them his word and he sent them to do it. And by experience, they learned how to do it. So he hand-trained his disciples. 
But here, he is giving them the assignment of training many more disciples. Now look what he says here in Matthew 28, starting in verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go you, that word power is authority. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, by the way, they are teaching the new birth. That, that, when Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do, and greater works, that's the greater work. In his lifetime on earth, he never got to lead anybody to the new birth. It wasn't available until after he was glorified. So the greater works. But see, what's happened today, the, the church at large has so focused on the greater work of the new birth, we've forgotten about the first works. He says, no, you're going to do the same works and that greater work. Okay? But go you therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, <clears throat> teaching them to observe, and I, I like how Dirk said it that, that day, I like it better, just do. That's, that's what it means. Teach them to do all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Okay? Now he's teaching them. See, no wonder there is a movement by the enemy, and I'm just going to say it that way, from pulpits and television pulpits all across the land right now, and they're doing their best to remove the sayings of Jesus from the church. They're saying that the words of Jesus do not apply to the Christian today, that somehow that was included in the Old Testament. You got a real problem there because the whole entirety of the Old Testament points to Jesus. Now come on, and then you're going to do away with his words? <clears throat> Besides that, what, he does not say here, uh, teaching, don't, he doesn't say this, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost and for the love of God, don't teach them what I taught you. I want you to teach them to do everything I taught you to do. Now, there's a lot in there. We could, we could go into all kinds of doctrine, holiness and and walking righteously, and so all those teachings of Jesus. But now there's a particular aspect right now because I'm mad, I'm angry that the enemy somehow keeps harvesting, and what I mean killing, our loved ones, and so far we're not able to stop them. And this word says we can stop that. We can stop it. See? So I'm focusing on this part, and I can't help but focus on it. I'm mad. I'm not going to put up with it, and you're not going to put up with it. We're going to stop that rascal from taking them. Okay? See, people say, but we have a promise of three score and ten. And they take that from the writings of Moses in the Psalms, you know. And, oh, you know, like, like, like that, that's the limit. Hey, well, that means my limit's coming up next month. <laughs> I'm going to be 70, three score and ten. Actually, if you read that, Moses was complaining. He wasn't saying that's the limit. He was going, God... Our forefathers lived a lot longer than us, and we're dying at 70. The last cutoff point was Abraham, and that's 120. And if you'll notice, that's still about where people, you know, it can go a little bit over, but roughly 120, the oldest people on earth, usually 118, 122, right in that ballpark. Not 70. Moses was complaining when he said that. He says, my goodness, we're dying off at 70. Anyway, that was free. <laughs> now here he says teaching them to do all things whatsoever I commanded you now let's, let's hook it up with Mark 16 though Mark 16 because yeah it includes a new birth now before I read Mark 16 in Matthew's gospel Jesus tells his hand trained disciples to go into all the nations and train teach them to do everything he had taught them in other words train them the very same way that Jesus had trained the original ones. You got it? So here in Mark 16, he said unto them, Go you into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, every person. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now that's the new birth. 
but he that believeth not shall be damned. But there's more than just the new birth, see. These signs shall follow them that believe. Now, believe what? Believe the training that the first disciples are giving these new converts. It's more than just the new birth. He said, I want you to train them to do everything I taught you to do. Well, what would that include? Well, in my name, if they believe what you tell them, they shall cast out devils. They who? They that believe. And when he says all nations, go ye into all the world, that for the Jew they had a hard time receiving that, but he's plainly telling them this is for the Gentile too. All the world. Go into all the nations. And if they'll believe it, in other words, let me say it this way. Look, you watch me do it. You watch me do the works. Then I hand trained you to do the works. After I'm gone, I want you to go and I want you to hand train other disciples. To get them born again and they're going to do the same works. Because you're going to hand train them the way that I hand trained you. Jesus never intended for his ministry of healing and delivering the people to come to an end when he was glorified. No wonder he said, it is expedient, it is better for you that I go away. Even when he was here, if he would have stayed, if he hadn't have gone to the cross, if he hadn't have been resurrected, if he'd have stayed just like he was, Dave was teaching on this one time, because I had trouble with that verse. How can you say it's better at the time I had an aunt who was dying of brain cancer, and the doctors had nothing they could do for her? And I, I, was, I was so angry at the time. And, and I'd go, Dave, how can Jesus say it's better? Because I know if he was on the earth, if I could get my Aunt Betty to him, she'd be healed. And then Dave, thank God for our pastor, he began teaching on that. He says, well, he said, yeah, God could have done it that way. And he says, uh, you know, Jesus could have an office in Jerusalem just exactly like he was in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Never went to the cross, never resurrected. Still have that same healing ministry today? You talk about take a number. <laughs> I finally got a number. I've been trying just to get a number to get in line to get my Aunt Betty to him. What's your number? One billion, three million, 270,000, whatever. And I get to see her and I get, to get it, I, get, I get to take her to him in four years. Aunt Betty didn't have four years. See, even when he was here, when he was here, the multitudes were too big. They were already too big. So he's going, even while he was here, he began expanding the work of the Father through the disciples who were not even yet born again. Never forget this. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that heals, not you. Amen. And it's really not the new nature in you. Jesus had the new nature from birth. He had that spirit, that life of God. What we call the new nature was his first nature. But he had it his whole life. But he never healed a single person. Never, no matter what the Apocrypha says, that's why they're not in our Bibles. The Apocrypha says things like when he was a little child, he, brought a little, he laid his hands on a dead bird and brought it like, back to life. No, he did not either. The, the, the water to wine is the beginning of miracles. That's the beginning of his miracle ministry. And he didn't do any miracles until after he himself was baptized in the Holy Ghost. The new nature causes you to be able to walk free from sin. But your new nature is not a miracle worker. The Holy Ghost is the miracle worker. And anyway. See, <clears throat> while we're, this verse just keeps coming up. I guess we're, I'm, I don't want to be disobedient. Now, we're going to get to Mark. We're going to finish Mark. But go to, go to John 14 just for a moment. They didn't know, I mean, Jesus had already told them this, but they hadn't experienced it yet. Jesus talking about him leaving and sending the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16. I will pray the Father. He shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him. Now, this is the part. But you know him. For he dwelleth with you. And shall be in you. Well for years I didn't really get what he meant by that. Now I do. When they left. Two by two. To go into those villages. 
based on nothing but the word of the king. And the, they taught, and then they preached, and then the time came to pray. And they had to be wondering, is that same Holy Ghost going to do? Is he going to manifest here the same way he manifested for Jesus? And when he did, they knew for sure the Holy Ghost was with them. They knew him in that sense. They knew that when they ministered in the name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit was with them to manifest the word. But Jesus said, that's not good enough. The day's going to come when you're not just going to know him that way. You're going to have the Holy Spirit in you the same way the Holy Spirit is in me. Okay. That was free right there. Okay. Mark, you still in Mark 16? So he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, <clears throat> these signs shall follow them that believe. And they've got to believe what? Believe the gospel that you're preaching to them. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Now, the only real examples we have of that that I can find in the New Testament is Paul when he was bitten by that serpent. That was a deadly snake. The people that lived on that island or lived in that land, when they saw that viper hanging off of his hand, they thought, well, he must be a murderer. He must be a murderer. He seemed like a nice guy, but look. He must be a murder, mur murderer, and this is God's judgment because nobody lives after they get bit by that snake. And they're watching. And Paul just shakes that thing off in the fire. And I see the natural mind, let's say it this way, science, will have no answer for that. Science will have no answer for that. When you're doing anything in the name of Jesus, and if a, even if a... Now, even if a deadly snake like that was to attack you, if the devil tries to kill you that way, you talk about having authority? You have authority over that, that poison in that snake. Science has no answer for that. But it's the truth anyway. If they try and poison you in some foreign land, you have authority over that poison. Now, science, that goes against everything that the natural man knows. But the natural man doesn't know how to turn water into wine either. There is no grape in H2O, you know. This is not a transformation. This is a creation. Because there is no grape in H2O. It's not just a matter of fermentation. It's a creative miracle. He created the grape. Anyway. And science has no answer for that. Heaven to the heaven, that's, a, that's like miracles 101. Simple. They, <clears throat> now, he does not say you can be stupid and start handling snakes in church. Amen. Show me that in the Bible. Show me that anywhere. You're not going to find that. There's no such thing as that. That's just foolishness. I'm sorry. Don't mean to offend anyone, but it is. Stop it. If you're involved in a church like that, get out of a church like that. And they, but here's the one. If they believe it, if they believe what you teach them, I taught you, I want you to go teach them, and if they'll believe what you teach them, they will lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Gary, have you laid hands on the sick and seen them die? More than I've seen them recover. Does that change Mark 16? Does that change the word of the king? Telling you we're going to teach the word, preach the word, demonstrate the word, pray and fast to drive unbelief out of us till the day comes. We're not the ones afraid of cancer. Cancer is afraid of us if there is such a thing. <clears throat> there, you know. Well, yeah, that fever. He rebuked the fever. I always thought that was amazing. He talked to the fever. Rebuked the fever. And it says, it left. I didn't know fever had ears. But it hurt him. He rebuked it and it left. Nice. We rebuke cancer, it'll go too. Have you seen it? 
Yes, sir, in Mark 16, I sure have. <laughs> I've seen it. Now, I have seen it through my nicotine-stained fingers, and i got to throw that in for the holy rollers out there. I believe in being holy. I preach holiness. But I'm on a path like you're on a path. Even Paul said he didn't think he'd arrived yet. He was still pressing toward the mark. And Sue and I, one of the most astounding early miracles we ever saw, we was in Oneonta, New York, little bitty church. This lady come up and stood in proxy for her friend who lived in another whole city. And we were pretty new at this then. We hadn't been at it very long. You know, and you're hoping in your first services when they come forward, they only have a headache. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you really... She said, can I stand in proxy for my friend? Sure. What's wrong with your friend? I'm thinking headache, sinus infection. She said, well, she's got cancer from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. She's already been through chemo and radiation, and the doctors have sent her home to die. Will you pray for her? Can I stand in here for her? And I'm going, well, how I'm really going... <laughs> Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. <laughs> Why did I come to this church? <laughs> Why did I accept this invitation? Oh, yeah, you told me to come. That's it. Why did you tell me to come? Anyway, none of you ever have thoughts like that on the inside. So I said, <clears throat> absolutely, you can stand in. Let us pray for you. Gary, you felt the anointing of God. They didn't hear it, but you heard Gabriel's trumpet, right? Liquid sunshine poured through the ceiling. You certainly felt that brush of an angel's wing as you prayed for her. I'm telling you, it was the most dead, dull. I try and describe what it felt like, and the closest thing I can think of is laying a dead fish on a doorknob. <laughs> no, that's about the, just nothing. Nothing at all. Of course, we finished that. Of course, that lady wasn't even there. She was standing in proxy, so we didn't get any report. Months later, I did get a report from that pastor who called me. That lady recovered from cancer. She had her before x-rays and her after x-rays. She was in full-time ministry now going everywhere saying, what the Lord did for me, he will do for you. I'll never forget that. That set me free from myself in so many ways. Because I sure know it wasn't me that healed, healed it. And it wasn't some kind of oozy, goosebump feeling. It was a Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost himself. He did it in the name of Jesus. Now why, why did that one happen and not the one recently? I don't know. I don't know all these. I, I don't know. Do you know everything yet? But I do know what the word says. Jesus healed them all. And it's going, before this is over, at every meeting, they will all be healed first time, every time, no exceptions. That's the way it'll be. Because Jesus said that's the way it'll be. They lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So, Gene, in my letter here, <laughs> in Mark's gospel, Jesus says the same thing, but he makes it clear that them that believe the training of the twelve would be able to do the same things in the name of Jesus. Let me say it like this. Jesus is saying to them, you saw me doing the works. I trained you to do the same works. Now I want you to go and train others in every nation to do those same works. Teach them to do everything I taught you to do. Now, we were just in John 14. We didn't read these two verses. I'll read them to you, though, because he foretold this even before the cross. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now, see, I didn't finish my story. That's the, great, the reason that it's better for us. Had he stayed on planet Earth in the form that he was then and anointed like he was then, if he'd never laid hands on the 12, if he'd never laid hands on the 70, if it was just him, he would still be doing the same works, but you would have to get to him physically to get it. <clears throat> Isn't that right? And it's too many. It was already too many in his day. So he multiplied by 12 and then he multiplied by 70. And now he's telling us, 
listen, it's the Father's plan that they not all have to come to Jerusalem or wherever I am to me personally. It's the Father's plan to duplicate me in you. Christ, which means the anointed one, in you, the hope of glory. That's why he told them, see, there is a difference between him sending them out and him sending us out. At least when he sent them, see, when he sent them out in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he just gave them the word of the king. But in Acts, let's go ahead and go to Acts chapter 1. When he sends them out there, when he's getting, when he's getting ready to commission them, that, that in this new dispensation, after the resurrection, Acts 1, verse 4. Now before he said, just go and preach the kingdom. Preach the gospel of the kingdom. Heal the sick. Cast out devils. So forth. He just told them go, didn't he? But this time he's telling them not to go. At least not until something happens. Verse 4. Being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not go. What if I said it that way? Before he said go. Now he's saying, I'm, I'm telling you, I don't want you to go. Don't you go, don't you depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. See, this time it's different. He knows there's a difference between being not born again and being born again. My job's to obey him. Why didn't he do that with them before? Why didn't he do the same thing before? Why didn't he tell them to get baptized with the Holy Ghost? Ag they were not born again. See, where religion messes up, they think you've got to be, you've got to get holy to receive the Holy Ghost. There is nothing, you, there is nothing any human can do to make themselves holy enough. For the Holy Ghost. Our, our righteousness in our own self-effort is as filthy rags. God had to create a holy of holies on the inside of you. Where the Holy Spirit could come live. And that is your recreated spirit. He had to create that. The reason he could come on Jesus like that. Jesus had that holy of holies. He had that life in him from conception in the womb of Mary. There was a holy of holies on the inside of Jesus, a spirit where the Holy Spirit could live, could dwell, could abide. But until these men were born again, men and women, until they were born again, there was no holy of holies. The Holy Spirit doesn't come because you made yourself holy. The Holy Spirit comes because God made you holy. He gave you a spirit that is created in righteousness and pure holiness. And that is the dwelling space of the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. That's why Jesus said, you know him. Yeah. He's with you. You've co-labored with him. You've worked with him. Yeah, he's with you. You know him. But he shall be in you. Whew. He wanted them anointed with the same Holy Ghost and power that he was anointed with. See, so there is a difference. Y'all getting anything out of this? I'm having a good time myself. <laughs> and one day it dawned on me. Let's get back to the word of the king just for a minute. See, we all keep waiting for a special revelation in a way. Now, you, you do have to wait for many things. I, I did not know I was a teacher when I began this in uh, 1992 when Sue and I first heard the message began praying. If anything, if you would if I'd have taken one of those quizzes, y'all ever see those little books? You take the test and find out what you are. You know, what they're doing, they're, they're checking your personality traits. Well, you must be a prophet. You must be this. You must be that. You know? I like what Kenneth Hagin, well, yeah, I like what, what Rama Bible Training Center says. So it's amazing how many prophets we have in role and how many ministry of helps we graduate. <laughs> The other one I love is they come in and say, we well, look all distressed. Well, I don't have the money to pay my tuition. Well, what's, what's the matter? Well, I've been asking God for prosperity, and all I keep getting is job offers. Anyway, 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. You do have, there's many things that you'll find out praying in the Holy Ghost. I would have thought I was a pastor. If, I, if you'd asked me in those early days, I, you know, that's the way I was raised. There's about the only thing left is pastor, missionary, and evangelist, you know. Teachers only teach Sunday school. Really, you know. I didn't know. I had to find that out from the Holy Ghost. But when it comes to your commissioning, we have the word of the king. Now, this is blanket. I don't care if you're a pastor, prophet, apostle. What, did he make any distinction? What was the distinction? Those that believe. Those that believe. What if I said disciples trained? He called his, he says, I've trained you. I want you to go train them. And he didn't limit it to any gifts. Now, there are gifts of the Spirit. That's another lesson, okay? But it says, those that believe the training, those that believe, they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Now, not even talking about the Holy Ghost yet so much in this, this lesson today. We have a lot of teaching on that. I want us to understand the word of the king. When those guys left on their mission two by two, what they had was the word of the king. Say it another way. What they had was the word of God. We have it in Mark 16. We are the generation being trained by those guys. How do you say that? We have, their right, we have their writings right here. This is how we're being trained. And, of course, we have the Holy Ghost. But I'm not emphasizing that part today. We have the word of the king. That if you will believe this gospel, you will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. We have the word of the king. And where the word of the king is, there is dominion. We should walk in. We have the word of the king. You've not only got the Holy Ghost with you, you've got the Holy Ghost in you. You've got the Holy Ghost on you. When you walk in, you walk in with the dominion of the king. And I mean sickness, every sickness and every disease has to bow. That is the word of God. I will preach it in the face of every circumstance. I, I don't care if a thousand falls on one side and ten thousand on the other. Those same bunch, if they were in heaven, if they could come back, they'd say, they'd give me the white hanky and they'd say, preach it, white boy, preach it. Because this is the truth. And it's going to change every circumstance. 